What's up, Breakthrough Success listeners? Mark Burry, the podcast and virtual summit launch coach here. And one of the things we need to think about is how are we building our wealth? How are we setting ourselves up so uh, we can keep on making money, but uh, our money starts working for us and allows us to live the lifestyle that we want to live. So in this episode, we'll be diving into the wealth philosophy and how we can build up our own wealth. The guest who joins us for this episode is the founder of Orbit Investments, which helps people invest in real estate that provides high-yielding passive income. Orbit Investments focuses on multifamily with specialties in land flipping and apartment complexes. Our guest who joins us for this episode of Breakthrough Success is none other than Jack Bosch. Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. I'm excited to be here. Jack, I'm so happy to have you on Breakthrough Success. And wealth is such an important topic because it allows us to live the lifestyle we want to live. It allows us to do the work that we want to do without feeling like uh, we have to be on this constant, endless grind. It just gives us more options and more choices. So I'm wondering if you could share with us your wealth journey, where you began, and then we could build more up into the how you listening to this episode could build up wealth. Uh, I would love to. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, wealth is such an important subject, and uh, and a lot of people, in my opinion, misunderstand what wealth means. A lot of people understand, uh, confuse wealth with income. Wealth and income are two completely different things. What, what we all, what most people focus on, is income optimization. And what I mean by that is job income optimization. So, um, and what, 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 what they mean by that, but there's something completely different that is, that is passive income optimization, or it, it, it's not always hundred percent passive, but if you focus on assets and ideally assets that spit out cash, and if, they, if you make that the focus of your life, then very soon, or not the focus of your life, but the focus of your financial life, then very soon you can be in a position that you don't have to focus on optimizing your job income anymore because the assets that you have acquired, that you have uh, structured and put together, actually provide you with more income than you could ever dream of. Now, this is just a quick introduction, and uh, so I, just because you mentioned to, to your introduction when you talked about assets being very important. My story is such that I did not grow up learning this. I did not grow up knowing this. I grew up, my dad is a high school teacher, so income, right? Uh, my grandfather, uh, on one, on my mother, my mom is a stay-at-home mom. My grandfather on my mother's side was a farmer, and then... Uh, once he gave that up, and it's after the Second World War, he was basically a clerk and clerk and the equivalent of a Walmart. Um, my grandfather on the my on my father's side was a clerk in some kind of like a Home Depot kind of store, and and none of them build up any significant wealth of any shape or form. As a result, they both they all worked until retirement, and luckily because the pension system and they still retire when they retired was still working very well they were able to retire okay and uh, and, and be okay financially but uh, uh, so when I grew up uh, but but bottom line is I grew up without any kind of like wealth mindset without any kind of like my parents are positive people and happy people and so on but, but it was always like classic rich dad poor dad kind of thing it was like go get a good education get a good uh, good job if something costs enough money it's like what do you think money grows under trees and things like that. So I went to, down the classic path of, of getting to college, getting a job, and then something bad happened that turned into something really good. And that is that um, the company I worked for uh, shrank by 40% from 7,000 people to 4,000 people in a matter of one year. And I had my, I came from Germany, I came here to the US, and I had my work visa tied to them so if I would have lost my job, I would have had to leave the country because nobody else would have gotten me a job in that time period. So I, I ended up being forced to look for plan B um, because plan A was, was, was a job, work until 65 and then retire and hopefully you have enough money accumulated that, it, uh, that, you, can, that, it, uh, that you don't outlive it, right? That's the, that's the wealth philosophy of the financial planners out there. 
So I, I, I instead was forced to look for something else and I found real estate. And through real estate, I first again focused on income generation, I flipping land. And flipping land became our cash machine. So we developed the, we developed the methods that allows us to buy pieces of land in the outskirts of town, in fill lots or larger acreage for literally five to 25 cents on a dollar. And then we turn around and immediately sell it to somebody else for half price, basically make two, three times our money, or we sell it for full price with seller financing where we allow them to take to put a down payment down and then make monthly payments. And through that process, we started realizing that getting, building that assets, that structure such that we get paid for many, many years is a much smoother life than having to chase deal after deal after deal. Now, we have done 4,000 deals and, and, and being able to do those deals has enabled us to get a ton of cash and so on. But now you're sitting on a bunch of cash, what do you do next? You need to invest it. So from that trajectory, so since you asked for the trajectory, from the trajectory of purely looking for income replacement, we went into real estate to replace our jobs, my wife and I, uh, she's also an immigrant from Honduras, Central America, and to then realizing that we're building up assets in terms of like mortgage notes that we own because we became the bank by selling these properties to sell a financing to then reinvesting that money into houses and apartment complexes so that now we actually have assets that we can hold on to for the rest of our lives and our daughter's life uh, that will spit out cash six figure and whatever in the, in the next probably a couple of years, seven figures a year cash, cash flow that we, that we can just sit on and, and enjoy and we don't have to do anything anymore. Um, that opened our eyes massively that the true power of financial abundance is in assets that spit out cash instead of in, in just chasing the higher income. Now the higher income is important because you, can, you, need, you need a cash machine to pay for the investments, but, but, but most people stop just at the cash machine and end up spending that money. Yeah, it's a really great, a lot of great points. And I mean, just having these assets that spit out cash makes it easier for you to retire, makes that whole process smoother and just allows you to not worry about money because there are so many people that spend so much time worrying about money. But if you invest uh, into these different assets, it's going to have a big impact on your wealth. And one of the things that I do want to talk about because uh, I like the idea of investing in assets. I don't invest in real estate. My big thing is dividend stocks uh, to get that quarterly payment. And you those real estate grants. I do want to do real estate investing in the future, but I'm wondering what do you see as some of the differences between investing in real estate versus stocks and uh, why you uh, prefer real estate? So I, I, if I have very little money in stocks, I, I actually, to be honest, I only own two shares of Amazon. That's all I own. <laughs> uh, but I have millions of dollars in real estate. Uh, we have over 30, uh, what was it? Over, um, I think almost $40 million that we own uh, that is under owner management. Not all of it is basically, uh, it's free and clear, but, uh, but there's obviously some depth on it. And that's actually gets me to the point. So, so real estate has two benefits that stocks typically don't have. And one of them is, or I have, in my mind, three benefits. Um, I like stocks. I, nothing wrong. If I would invest in stocks, I would do exactly what you do, which is dividend stocks. It goes for the cash flow. So you have an asset that spits out cash and it goes up in value, right? Ideally over time. So perfect world. What I like about real estate is that it has a third aspect on it. It's an asset, particularly income producing real estate. It has, uh, like I'd say, a, a rental house or even better, a large apartment complex. Uh, so a large apartment complex, for, complex, for example, has, has number one, it appreciates, just like stock, so there's no difference there. Number two, it spits out cash, just like dividend stock, so not much different there. Even though the amount of cash it spits out, sometimes if you buy right, can be dramatically more. So we have, we're just buying an apartment complex that within a year or two will spit out about a 12 to 15% uh, uh, percent return on, on, uh, on the purchase price. So that's obviously great. I have bought a piece of real estate for $94,000 one time. It's a car repair shop that spits out uh, $27,000 net cash flow per year. So that's a 25% return per year. And it goes up in value. 
So that's those. Sometimes you can get to numbers that are just sometimes extremely hard to get to in the stock market. The third part, nothing wrong with the stock market. So, but uh, the third part is that you can actually buy with leverage. Now, I'm extremely conservative, so I like buying with reasonable leverage. So, for example, if a bank was willing to give me 80% of the purchase price, I might only accept 70%. Or so, or sometimes, and that is like on a purchase, on a purchase, on a deal that I'm going to improve and make worth much more afterwards. So we have, for example, we're literally this week buying a 158 unit apartment complex for $5.3 million. Now we're putting investors together for that. It's a syndication. But after that, so we have $5.3 million in it. We're having an, an um, we're going to spend $850,000 on improving that property. So at the, at the result, we're going to be, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, we're gonna be in that deal for $6.15 million. And we already got the appraisal that estimates the value after these repairs are made for set, that the appraisal, it's going to be seven, worth $7.1 million. So now on that deal, we're taking about a four, uh, $4.5 million loan so we're going to have a property worth $7.1 million with a $4.5 million loan. I don't know exactly what the number is, but it's something like 65 70% of value that is the leverage. So it's a very conservative leverage that we can always service. Even if the world comes to the end, people still going to play, need a place to live. We can service that. And then the next part, so leverage, though, allows you to have less money and get, uh, with less money, get to a bigger deal. And then when the deal goes up in, in value, it goes, the entire deal goes up in value and you can, you can benefit from that over proportional. Uh, the next, the other part that I really like about real estate, and that's a key part that's, uh, is that you actually, and that you definitely can, can't get with stocks is you can actually get tax benefits. For example, on the income from that apartment complex for the next five years, we're going to pay exactly an estimated tax rate of zero because a piece of real estate is going to be depreciated, depreciated over time. And that depreciation counts against your income, uh, income profits. And we did the calculation and we estimate that pretty much 100% of the income of that property for the next five years is going to be shielded by the depreciation that comes with it. Now, again, if in five years, let's say we sell that property, we then have to pay taxes on the depreciation. It's called what's called it's getting recaptured. So you actually it's it's clawed back and so on. But even then, we only pay capital gains taxes on it. So overall, we're we're delaying our tax liability by five years. And then there's additional ways that we can even delay by another five, 10, 15 years and eventually potentially even delay it all the way past our death. And I mean, you hit on a lot of the real estate points that like leverage in real estate, you get a lot more of real estate leverage than with stock market leverage. And the tax shield is definitely not something I get with the dividend stocks. Now, one thing I do want to point out to everyone listening is uh, it's not like you buy this asset, dividend stock or real estate, and you get this set amount of turn for all these years. Like, uh, because sometimes like rates are going to go up. So, I'll give you an example. One of the things I own is Cisco. That's one of the uh, stocks that I own. And recently they went from 33 cents per share for the dividend to 35 cents per share. And I didn't change my position or anything like that. Now I'm getting another two cents per share per quarter. And you see stocks like they go up, the they raise a the dividend each year, some by much higher amounts. And the same thing happens for real estate. I don't know as much about that space. So I'll invite Jack to speak about that soon. But uh, rents go up in relation to things like inflation and uh, other things like that, competition. So uh, part of the reason I bring this up is I want to hear your thoughts on the management because you are dealing with people when it comes to finding tenants for properties. So I'm wondering if you could share how you deal with it from like a business standpoint because you're in it to make a profit and how to deal with some of the bad tenants as well. Right. So uh, to your point, I 100% agree. And that's a beautiful thing about where, uh, as I said, dividend stocks, I'll, I'll, if I were to invest in the stock market, that's what I would be. And uh, the other part about dividend stock that is good is that in the stock market, it is a passive investment. You, you buy, you hold, and you get a quarterly dividend. You don't have to do anything in the, in the, in, in the deal. 
and and that also uh, and that goes to, towards your point um, of like when in real estate, there's also two ways to do this. There's obviously the people that own Cisco and they're very actively involved in it. And then there's the people that own shares of Cisco and they're very passively involved in it. So it's the same on real estate because when I go, I, I chose to be the active one. I, I could take the money that I make and invest it in with other people that do what we do. And occasionally we do that. Uh, but uh, invested with other people that do what we do. But we chose to be the active ones because real estate is just what I love doing all day long. I'm going to do this until the day I die. But our investors, they're in the exact same position as you are, as you described. Let's say they get a 6% or 7% preferred return. Um, but then also, what, for example, they're getting a bonus. They're getting extra money when we sell the property or there's scenarios that if we got over a certain amount, uh, then they might get a bonus payment on top of that and, and things like that. There's different ways that you can do those things. When that leads me now to the, to the other question about management. Management is like when we, if you look at our trajectory, how we discovered the asset management, the asset life, as I want to call it, um, or as my wife calls it, actually, she coined more of that during the asset thinking as she coins it. Asset thinking is the term that she coined. Uh, we, we transitioned from income thinking to asset thinking. And asset thinking is one of the things, one of the reasons we are active is that we want to own the asset. We don't just want to be owner of an asset that somebody else manages. We want to own the asset. So what, uh, what in the management point is a big point. So the, when we transition from just from land flipping, again, usually profitable. We actually teach this. We have programs for that. We, lots of our students are, are usually successful. Um, a couple of them have broken a million dollar profit mark uh, this year. And, um, and they, but what we, when we transitioned, when we started taking the money that we made in land flipping and still making land flipping and started pulling them over into real estate, we started buying single family houses. And in single family houses, they are actually much more difficult to manage, in my opinion, than a multifamily property. Now, not necessarily for the people on board or for the people on the ground, but as the owner, because all our deals that we have, all of the single family properties, we have almost 50 of them. And then all the 400 units of our, or as of next week, 500 units of apartment complex units that we have are managed by professional property management companies. So they get a little fee for doing that. But then they deal with the tenants, they deal with the vetting, they deal with the evictions and so on. So, so the part of that is at the first few years we did this ourselves. And to be honest, we were really bad at it. It takes two, three years to get good at it because we, we, we let people, oh, we like that person. Let's rent to them, right? And uh, of course, multiple people had the same qualifications. So we followed all the rules, but we, uh, we ended up renting to the person we liked instead of to the person that that perhaps we should have rented or so i don't know uh, exactly but but then when the rent renewal comes up we're like we didn't increase rents because they were like oh no or we my daughter just had surgery and this happened and that happened we're just like okay we felt bad the moment we handed it off to a professional company out there they just follow rules and if the rules is if the rent is not in by the fifth a letter goes out if the rent is not in by the 15th a, uh, the court getting a, 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 the, an eviction gets filed. If the eviction, if they don't show up to the eviction, they're getting, they're getting kicked out. And it's just like, you're, you're using uh, your, your, it's my property. You have the benefit of uh, the privilege of using my property in exchange for rent payment. You don't pay rent. You shouldn't be living there. So it's kind of very reasonable exchange. My, my exchange kind of uh, uh, um, philosophy there. So, so once we, did, once we brought it over to the multi, the reason why we moved from single family to multifamily though, part of it was management because in a single family, even if you have a, a, um, a property management company there, the moment something goes wrong, the moment something breaks, plumbing breaks, some the sink breaks or something like that, uh, typically the property management company, if it's a more than like three or $500, they will reach out to you and ask for your uh, authorization. Now, if you have 40 or 50 houses like that, then you're going to get a notification almost every other day that something broke. Mm -hmm. And that's just annoying and it drags you down and it's not fun to do. When we deal with a multifamily property, uh, all of a sudden we, have, we are two layers, two layers away from that. First of all, in the 150 units that we're buying right now, we have four full-time team members working at that property, two maintenance people, two office people. 
right? The office is a leasing manager, a leasing agent, and then a maintenance manager and a make ready manager. Basically the maintenance manager fixes stuff, the make ready takes units where somebody moves out, makes them ready again to be, to be moved out. They have an inventory there. They have a budget for the year that's pre-authorized that they can use things. If something breaks, they just fix it. If something breaks higher, if something more breaks or some bigger issue comes up, they don't call me, they call the regional manager of the property management company. And then the regional manager once a week discusses things with me for about 10 to 15 minutes. That's the process. So as a result, we, we, we develop a rehab budget, we develop a process for those, for this big property. And then the, the regional manager with the people on the ground go implement that. We develop a criteria for tenants and then they go vet tenants, they go evict tenants, they go lease to tenants, they go enforce the rent, they do all of this stuff and we have absolutely nothing to do with this anymore on a daily basis. That's why I love apartment complexes. And then one last part of apartment complex, part of, uh, the reason why we are active in that, in that business is that there's one lever that I forgot to mention. In the apartment complex business, an apartment complex or any kind of commercial property is an income generating property and therefore the value of it is not that of the neighboring properties. Like if you have a rental property, Mark, and uh, let's say you had a rental property and, and you, you manage to make it so pretty inside that you get $500 more in rent than, the, than anyone else in the neighborhood. The moment you go sell that property, you're gonna, that property will sell for the exact same amount that five of the other houses in the neighborhood of similar size have just sold. You agree with me on that, right? Yeah. But that's because that's how it, that's how it works. Like houses are selling based on comparables. Apartment complexes, on the contrary, they're selling as a multiple of income, just like the stocks that you're buying. There, there's an income uh, earnings to uh, earnings was like uh, price to earnings ratio, and it's exactly the same thing. There is a there's a cap rate that indicates what that ratio is, and that ratio sometimes is um, it's cap rate is too complicated to explain right now. But in essence, uh, typically for every thousand dollars that you increase the income of a property the value of that property goes up by fifteen to $17,000 in some markets, even by $20,000. Wow. So in other words, when we buy properties, we buy properties that need a little bit of improvements where the rents are below market. We're, we're bringing the rents up by like something like $200,000 uh, a year, which means we're making $200,000 more income, which a lot of it goes to our investors, a lot of it uh, and a little bit of it goes to us. But then because we increase the value at the, the income by $200,000, this property is now up to three and a half or four million dollars worth more than it was before. So now not only have we increased the income, we also increased the value of the, of the property and we got the tax benefits. And, uh, and, and now, and, and all of this is just a beautiful, beautiful piece to put together. And, uh, and for those who don't want to do this actively, they can invest passively with us. So, so that's, uh, or with other people too. Uh, and that's, that's why we like real estate because it has all these levers that the stock market has too, but for the owners of Cisco, for the top managements of Cisco, and I'm never going to be a top manager of Cisco. So I, uh, I rather manager of Oak Creek apartment complex and be the asset manager of that thing and make sure that thing goes up in $200,000 in income and $4 million in value. And I do that multiple times a year. And can you see how much asset and how much value and how much, how much um, yeah, wealth you can create with that? It's just off the charts. Yeah, I mean, really great stuff. I definitely get the uh, apartment reference because I look at all those P's and all that stuff for the stocks. And it's just fascinating to hear the real estate side. And Orbit Investments, definitely a good place to go if you guys enjoyed this interview. One of the things I love about doing this show and uh, being able to interview people like Jack is you get to uh, hear what Jack is all about so you can determine if it's a good investment, Orbit Investments or something similar. So Orbit Investments will be in the show notes. Shaq, are there any other places that you want us to go to find more of your work and follow you on your journey? Sure. Uh, the easiest way to find out about this land flipping piece that has become, because most people in the situation is like, well, great. You're talking about 
buying a property for $5 million, how in the world do I get started even, even with just like real estate in general? Well, we got started with land flipping and the land flipping, we, we bought our first property for $400 and sold it for $4,000. We bought the second property for $500, literally free and clear, no mortgage on it and sold it for $10,000. And that's how we built this up from nothing. We came to this country with two suitcases, a bunch of student debt, lived in a 400 square foot apartment right next to the train tracks. Uh, and, and we built this into, into this well mini empire here. And, um, and the, and the best way to learn how to, if you need to get started with something, I would, I would I recommend you check out www.landprofitfun.com. Fun, like having fun. So F U N. So land profit fun.com. And there you can watch a video and watch some stuff and get some free information uh, on how that land flipping works. Well, Jack, thank you for sharing that resource. Any way to go from 400 to 4k or 500 to 10k is definitely going to be something people are interested in. So landprofitfund.com will be in the show notes. Once again, thank you so much for joining us on Breakthrough Success. It was such a pleasure having you on the show.